Orientation to the home story. Nothing in nature is born without a birthplace and a matrix, its mothering entity. This law applies to microbes, animals, even the oceans and clouds. Likewise, no myth, metaphysical teaching, spiritual system, religion, ideology, work of art, or scientific theory comes into the world out of nowhere. Every event that confers self-understanding on the human species comes not from humanity in an abstract sense, but from a particular locale in the world inhabited by a distinct racial strain. In Japanese creation myth, for instance, comes from the island of Japan and its native peoples. Aztec mythology arose from the landscape and mindset of the Mesoamerican peoples, the local tribes. The dominant belief system in the world today, the trio of Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, came originally out of Canaan, modern Palestine, and spread across the world from there. The home story also has a specific geographic and racial origin. As you learn the narrative, it will be instructive to consider the backstory of the FGS, a term from filmmaking that describes the preceding conditions of a movie plot. This consideration is not required, but it may be desired if you are an individual inclined to wonder about origins. The home story has a backstory, like any other mythic narrative or religious system, any spiritual program you can name, such as Buddhism, Wicca, or the Nation of Islam. But there is a difference with this narrative, and it is huge. Due to its encompassing scope, the Fallen Goddess scenario is a story to guide all the races of the world and even to describe the diverse roles they hold in what Gnostics today call the divine experiment. The home story differs from all other creation myths, so-called, in the way it addresses the totality of the human situation planet-wide, even though it arises from a specific geographic, and racial origin. Its application goes to all racial variations of the human species, but it comes to the world as a product of the religious imagination of a particular people, one certain race. So before delving into the narrative, it may be worthwhile to give your attention to the following orientation. The Sources The sacred narrative of the mysteries explains the cosmic origins of life and human purpose on earth in a way not to be found elsewhere. No other body of myth or legend from any culture or epoch presents a creation myth as vivid, comprehensive, and coherent as this one. Likewise, no other narrative explains the ultimate truth about evil and how it works against all that is good and beautiful on our precious planet. The home story is the cosmic biography of the living earth. It is also the supreme heresy of all time. Due to its exceptional message, this narrative has been attacked, distorted, maligned, and suppressed more violently and more continuously over centuries than any concept in all of history. Consequently, textual evidence of the FGS only survives in sparse and fragmentary form, like shards remaining from a large, shattered mosaic. But it does survive. The rare materials that preserve the myth of the wisdom goddess were discovered in the Middle East and Egypt. How then can it be the guiding narrative of the native European races? Also, since the myth comes from an ancient movement 
that originated in northwestern Iran, how can it be designated as European at all? Against these objections, two points of clarification will perhaps be helpful. First, those who developed this narrative came from the native stock of peoples whose homeland was in the Caucasus Mountains. They were cousins to the Aryan, Celtic, Nordic, Teutonic, Italic, Iberian races that lived all over Europe. Proof of this long enduring kinship can be seen in the astonishing physical similarities between the Ossetian people of the Caucasus and the Celts of Ireland. The authors of the FGS were ancestors of those diverse peoples designated as white, peoples who survive today as the racial minority in the world population, about 8%. Second, the Iranian racial stock that produced the home story stood entirely distinct from the Arab Asiatic peoples who inhabit Iran and neighboring regions today. And of course, they lived long before those inhabitants were converted to Islam or Christianity or Judaism. Elsewhere around the Mediterranean basin and across Europe, from Greece to the British Isles, from Spain to Scandinavia, diverse peoples sprang from the same racial stock. The home story is the unique product of the religious imagination of Aryan Caucasians or Indo-European peoples, a spectrum of races that originally and exclusively occupied the vast reaches of Western Europe and eastward as well, extending into Iran and even India, whose population contains a significant Aryan mixture to this day. The Sanskrit-derived word Aryan comes from the Indo-European root Arya, noble, excellent. Not to say that only those of Aryan descent possess and express these qualities. Rather, the Aryan lineage exemplifies the attributes of nobility and excellence, ideally to be attained by all races. That attainment, however, must be proven, demonstrated in values, attitudes, and action. A further question. Can counterparts of the Iranian version of the home story be found in European mythologies from Britain, Scandinavia, Greece, Germany, Italy, France, Spain, and elsewhere. What about national epochs such as the Kalevala of Finland? The rich trove of Greco-Roman mythology, Germanic folklore, or Irish, Welsh, and Basque legends. Looking back at those vanished cultures in their original pre-Christian state of native purity, do you find any versions and variations of the fallen goddess scenario? Do any of those sources offer a story based centrally on the figure of an earth goddess comparable to the Sophia of the Mysteries? Do they present in any way versions and variations of the home story such that it might be recovered and retrieved in those materials? Well, yes, they do. But those original versions are chaotic, incomplete, and inconsistent. They do not present the entire plot of the narrative. Far from it. They are at best mangled variations and random fragments. The European heritage, sadly, only retains some random elements, names, and incidents pertinent to the home story only partial features of the FGS, fleeting glimpses of it, can be found in the comparative myth, folklore, and legend of Europe that survive today. Why? Quite simply due to the fact noted above, 
The home story has been so relentlessly attacked that only scattered clues from it survive. Across Europe, almost all evidence of it has been deliberately suppressed and placed under taboo, if not actively demolished. For example, Nordic myth does not offer a coherent rendering of the Sophianic narrative, not even isolated episodes or extracts. Only a version of her name survives, the name of the goddess Ostara, and that name is borrowed from the Germanic peoples, whose mythological heritage likewise was demolished when Christianity overtook Europe. All that remains is the name, Ostara, without a single clear storyline about her, without a clue to her origins and her continuing existence. The Background the FGS is not the work of a single human author. It was developed over many generations by the Magian Order, a community of visionary teachers. The Magians were the pagan pre-Christian forerunners of the Gnostics. They called themselves Telestai, those who are aimed. What aimed them? It was their intimate access to the intelligence of the living earth the telluric matrix of life. In their united dedication to the sacred narrative of Sophia, they preserved and revised the home story over many generations. Their name for the wisdom goddess in the ancient Persian was Spandarmat. It means expansive vibrating mother the measured web of life. The Iranian mother goddess known to the Magians carries one of the earliest names of Sophia, who was also called Anahita. The mother goddess or earth mother is of course a universal archetype. Some version or another of that figure occurs in all indigenous animistic societies in all lands. The major Gnostics detected this divine maternal figure in a living presence to be encountered and engaged. Animistic peoples who directly sense the presence of the living earth rarely go beyond that sensation into deeper dimensions of knowing. They remain emotionally captivated by that power and are most often merely superstitious about it. The Telestai were different. They blazed the trail into profound and intimate engagement with the intelligence of nature. They conversed directly with the mind of the planet. They were intellectual shamans, highly accomplished in visionary practices, paranormal faculties, literacy, mathematics, astronomy, the natural sciences and art forms of all kinds, including music and dance. Accessing the mind of the living earth by a special method of trance, they were able to construct the FGS based on repeated and deliberate close encounters with the main character in the story, Sophia. Knowing the earth mother in such an intimate and penetrating way they were able to construct a story about her unlike any other in its scope and detail. The origins of the Magian Order date to about 6000 BCE. Much later on, their beneficiaries, the Gnostics, inherited and preserved their narrative and their method. Over centuries, they accomplished the complete narrative of today, the home story. The discovery in 1945 of books hidden in a cave at Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt made it possible, after centuries of repression and destruction, to restore the full-scale coherent narrative of the wisdom goddess. Collated with other materials from European antiquity and Near Eastern myth, the Nag Hammadi codices are the primary basis for recovery of the Sophianic myth. 
The Mysteries. Volumes have been written about the mysteries, mystery religions or mystery schools of pagan antiquity. Unfortunately, attempts to explain this topic fail from the outset due to lack of evidence of what actually occurred in those long forgotten cultures. Honest scholars concur that the practices and procedures of the mysteries are unknown, having been protected by a vow of silence, not secrecy, silence. Unfortunately, again, those today who claim to know about the mysteries often accuse their adepts of satanic rites, human sacrifice, mind control programming, and other sinister procedures. The schools were Illuminati think tanks, as a popular meme asserts. This claim is totally untrue, and there is not a shred of evidence to support it. Scholars agree that participants in the mysteries accessed in some manner the deepest truth about human existence, going to the tap root of life and consciousness. There is precious little evidence of how they did so, but there is enough to assert that Gnostics, the heirs of the Magian Order, were men and women of high intellectual achievement and spiritual vision. Skilled in shamanic arts, they were the guides and educators of the ancient world in the Near East, around the Mediterranean Basin, and all across Europe, an assertion supported by ample and various evidence. The mysteries were adapted bioregionally so that they met the needs of the local inhabitants and matched their mindset and their specific talents and skills. And the leaders of the mysteries went by different names reflecting the different languages spoken in each region. For instance, in Northern Europe, the teacher was a druid, meaning literally the oak seer or tree seer, whereas in Egypt, the teacher was a foster, meaning a light bearer, an illumined one. Historical records show that the druids of the British Isles actually conferred and met and mingled with the teachers of the great school of Alexandria in Egypt. In Scandinavia, the shamanic teacher was called Woden or Odin. This was not the name of a particular man, but rather a title of one who possessed clairvoyant powers, an accomplished shaman. In India, those members of the same mystery network were called by various names, such as Vijadara, meaning wisdom holder, and Sitha, accomplished adept, one who possessed and demonstrated occult powers. And there were many other variations of such names and honorific titles. All in all, the teachers of the mysteries comprised the spiritual aristocracy, if you will. But it was a working aristocracy dedicated to the education of the races and the guidance of humanity on its proper course of development. Their paramount tool of guidance was the sacred narrative, the home story. The central figure of the mystery school network was the wisdom goddess Sophia, known by names differing by region and people. Her name in Greek means wisdom. Philosophia was originally love of wisdom and by extension, love of the goddess herself, known in her living presence. Due to their intimacy with her, the Teleste had quite a few terms of affection for Sophia, such as prunikos, meaning outrageous, daring, audacious. Also, the Aramanic word heita, who gives birth to life, which is a play on hewa, wise serpent, is another example coming from the network of the mystery schools. By the way, it is striking how the Aramaic Hewa closely echoes the mother tree goddess of Avatar, Ewa. Sophia was known as Ostara and Spandarmat 
as already noted, that would be among the ancient Persians who were Aryan peoples. Among the Ossetians or Alani people of the Caucasus, she was called Satanaya. Among the Persians, who were Aryan peoples, Anahita. In the Norse language, Yod. Among the Basque people, Mari. The Etruscans called her Sel. Uni and Sembla Thalma. In the Minoan culture of Crete, Potnia Theron, mistress of the animals. And there are dozens and dozens of other variations. Of course, there are also worldwide variations of her name from every continent and every region of every continent in the world as well. Mystics who looked into nature with paranormal skill knew that the planet, which is too large to be seen entirely when you are on it, revealed itself in local phenomena, epiphanies or revelations coming through nature itself. Sophia revealed herself through animal powers, such as the epiphany of snake woman, her revelations came principally as snake and tree, but also other particular animals, such as the bull, lion, panther, or birds, such as the eagle, swan, and owl. Gnostics today have reverential names for the Earth Mother, the Aeon Sophia, or the Aeonic Mother, the Divine Mother, world mother, or simply Pam, planetary animal mother. Aeon is Greek for generating power, God force, divinity, supernatural creative energy. Direct contact with the living intelligence of the earth afforded the teachers of the mystery schools with endless sublime discoveries. They learned secrets of the cosmic setting of life terrestrial physics, the myriad patterns of animal life and behavior, the living properties of sky and mountain, the miraculous awareness of bodies of water, such as springs, streams, lakes, rivers, the great oceans. Among all these wonders, they focused intensely on the presence and role of human animals in the cosmic order. They saw this role as being special and exceptional, yes, but not as being in some way superior to other forms of animal life or to nature itself as a whole. The scope of their detective powers, as they might be called, was vast. They also observed the effects of extra biospheric intrusion upon the earth, known today largely through the E.T. enigma. The more they learned, the more thoroughly and meticulously they developed the plot of the home story. There is one momentous teaching of the mysteries that perhaps exceeds all others. The Teleste realized that the divine presence of Sophia did not merely arise when the earth took form. Rather, Sophia pre-existed the earth on the galactic level as a star goddess. And equally astonishing is their assertion that Sophia did not create the earth. She turned into it. The origin of Sophia is in the galactic core. The home story is an astronomical myth. Gnostics did not use the routine religious syntax of creation. Instead, they explained by exhaustive writing and teaching the cosmic process of emanation or emergence, which resembles dreaming. In essence, they taught that the star goddess Sophia dreams the planetary body as someone asleep produces a dream body and so acts within the dream. Yet her dream planet 
is wholly material, sensorially and physically real. It is not maya, regarded as mere illusion, which, by the way, is a mistranslation of maya. The initiates of the mysteries verified their discoveries over and over again through shamanic practice of ecstatic trance, performed in couples and in groups of four, eight, and 16. They saw no contradiction between reason and revelation. Gnosis is direct knowledge of the supernatural that can be verified by reason based on evidence in the natural world and in the workings of the human psyche. It is what today is called noetic science or cognitive psychology, but in a sophisticated form that does not exclude mystical and paranormal dimensions of experience. Guided by the sacred narrative, the initiates of the mysteries developed what can be called Gnostic intel to a high level of refinement and exactitude. As they were aimed, so they strove in turn to aim the races to guide humanity on the way to fulfill its inner endowment as a genius species. Their purpose and plan was higher education along what might be called spiritual lines. On that path, they inspired their students to evolve beyond being mere passive inhabitants of the planet toward active engagement with the dreaming power that produces and sustains the human habitat. So also is the aim of Gnosis today. The legacy of the mysteries today remains squarely based on the sacred narrative the opportunity for all who learn the Sophianic vision story and choose to live in the narrative is an incomparable privilege. Participate in the dreaming activity of the Aeon Sophia so that you play an active role in the outcome of what she dreams. But that opportunity comes with responsibilities. The challenge. Ideologues of the three Abrahamic religions hate the Sophianic myth, and well they should, for it challenges their fundamental beliefs and answers many questions that otherwise must be left to faith. What's more, it presents a narrative with the power to entirely overthrow their creation stories and render them useless and absurd. The heresy coming out of the mysteries makes those faith systems look extremely stupid and exposes the harmful deceits of blind faith. Gnosis presented in its time and still presents today a frontal threat to religious faith and its accessories. Orthodoxy, authority, hierarchy, and most of all, moral rules said to be dictated by an off-planet creator God, the Heavenly Father. Gnosis has always been the opposition movement to all belief systems. It does not present an alternative religion, but an alternative to all religions. Engagement with the Sophianic myth may be compared to filmmaking, Actors who play roles and deliver lines have to know the plot of the film. Others who appear in the film have no significant roles and no speaking parts. Their participation does not require knowing anything about the plot of the movie, far less about the intention of the director, screenwriter, and the principal cast. Those who are ignorant of the plot are the extras, comparable to NPCs non-player characters in a video game. By the Gnostic standard of today, to be ignorant of the plot of the home story is to be an extra in the dreamed scenario of the world mother. What transpires in life as we know it is her movie, an event happening in her greater life as an aeon, a cosmic scale divinity. Learning the sacred narrative enables you to see a role for yourself in the plot of the spectacular film in progress. 
You win the role by owning your power to merge with her power and by recognizing that you do live in a dream, though you are not the dreamer. But to win the role, to own the role is one thing and to act the part is another. The goal of the living Gnosis today is to live with a clear sense of transpersonal direction guided by the sacred narrative, which aligns you to the designs and purposes of the wisdom goddess. Living in that way affords the optimal chance to express innate talents and gifts that you have as an individual person and enjoy a chosen role as a unique character in the spectrum of the human races. The transpersonal fulfills the personal. The personal cannot fulfill itself. Conclusion. The most beautiful story on earth is the story about the earth, the sentient and intelligent mother planet. It can be called a vision story, yes, not to be mistaken for a fantasy trip or a grandiose game of pretending. In fact, the home story totally demolishes the narcissistic claim that we are gods. Sophanic myth is light years beyond New Age make-believe and is, in fact, the perfect antidote to it. The home story is a meta-narrative that you test and verify at every point of engagement with it. There is some talk today about the need for a meta-narrative to unite good and honest folk in all lands who want to see the world turn for the better and wish to be instrumental in that shift. The meta-narrative does exist and must not be taken on authority. You can only believe the life story of the world mother to the extent that you live it for real. Those today who see the need for a meta-narrative face a dilemma. Would they be able to recognize it when presented to them? Perhaps they think they can, by themselves, construct a meta-narrative, a new myth. Good luck to them on that. Comparative mythology is the comprehensive study of topics, themes, characters, and events found in the myths of all cultures over time. Without extensive skill in this genre, it is impossible to compare the fallen goddess scenario to other myths and determine its unique and outstanding properties. In short, it's a professional call. Not to be taken on faith, however, only in the perspective of comparative mythology do the exceptional features of the FGS become obvious. But once that observation has been made, the truth is there to see, independent of expertise. Verification of the myth depends entirely on first-person participation. Certainly, the myth is complex. It does require practice and intellectual determination to master. To put into practice the Sophianic myth relies on basic intelligence, but it also sharpens, enhances, and amplifies the mental effort brought to it. The dubious presumption of IQ is not an issue here. Participation relies merely on the will to learn. What finally would attract anyone to get involved in this elaborate mythic narrative? Those who seek purpose in life will find both the frame and foundation for it in this visionary tale. That already is a huge factor of attraction and there is more as well. Gnostics taught that Sophia was compelled by overwhelming desire to plunge into the experiment conducted with the species singularity she herself had designed, acting in the galactic core, the Pleroma, with her consort, Thelite. Participation in the home story begins with a natural feeling for empathy for the Divine Mother. In that empathy, 
you can realize how a superhuman divinity can be sentient like yourself, subject to emotions of joy, daring, terror, pleasure, confusion, grief, as the narrative fully describes. That being so, it is no longer possible to think of the earth as a gigantic rock floating in a cosmic void. No, Sophia is alive, intelligent, emotively responsive, self-conscious of her planetary body, and coactive with all that lives, especially with human animals. Sophianic myth has many dimensions of meaning and applications to life. Its total impact converges and dwells on a point of aesthetics. As nature is beautiful, so is the supernatural source of the natural world. The natural world is lovely and bountiful in countless ways. Likewise, the world mother, the dreaming goddess at its source, but infinitely more so. Those who learn and come to love the spectacular star myth about Sophia all realize that this particular cosmic divinity is all about aesthetics. The most beautiful story on earth is the story about the earth. Finally, or perhaps from the beginning, there is one paramount factor that brings you home to the home story and compels you to get involved and do your part to determine its outcome. That factor is beauty.